in and out, in and out, goes right in and comes right out. You're listening to Grand Turismo's episode 11. Tonight on Grand Turismo's, we talk about the Austria World Tour, the New York World Tour. We talk about the best car to rush Area 51 with. Is our experience with Twisted Metal going to assist a raid of secret alien technology? Or will we only end up with a cone in the head? Bruce Willis is <laughs> TTG Senate. <Senate's in> <laughs> Sorry, that's too good. Uh, Daniel Day Lewis as Kazanori Yomauchi. <laughs> Yomauchi. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining Grand Turismo Bros. I'm Road Beef, and with me is Eddie the Wardez Gomez. Say hi to the crowd, Eddie. Hi to the crowd. Excellent. You literal man. That's why I love you. We will recap the last stage for eligibility to the Austria World Tour. We will discuss the upcoming New York World Tour set to begin before Austria. We will cover the changes made in the 1.41 update, BOP, tire model, etc. Many things to consider. Also, big news... Gran Turismo 5 revealed to have dozens of secret tracks, most likely used in uh, production of Gran Turismo 5. Just what does it mean? What can we discern? I think there's a lot of uh, juicy tidbits in there. We've got uh, some other ideas to uh, to fill in the topics. I am excited to be doing our show again. It's felt like a very long time. So much stuff's happened in between the World Tour show and this one. I feel like we're different racers. Uh, I started wearing gold chains. Uh, Tristan, you Dude, know... So did I. He started putting money away in weird countries. We're, we're living large. Uh, we're winning races. It's crazy, man. Uh, I feel like Gran Turismo, there are literally dozens of us out there. You found the right podcast because we're going to talk a lot about Gran Turismo because you're one of our Gran Turismo's bro hug. Whoa. Squeesh. Whoa, bro hug. Get in there. Get up yeah. in that. It's a tight knit community, but it's uh, not that smelly. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, the right kind of smelly. You know, you, you fill your nostrils with love. <laughs> I wonder how those Austrian showers are going to be. Tristan, oh, we're, to con- we're going to have bidets. Oh, <laughs> rejoice. Sho- rejoice. Uh, Vinicius. Vinicius would say little showers. I've been calling him little showers ever since he's so uh, eloquently started using that in the WhatsApp group. Uh, yes. So, uh, but yes, congratulations, Tristan. I'm super hyped for you, man. You're going all the way to the Dude. big A-U. Uh, Stria. <laughs> Not Australia. Not not Australia, you know, a shrimp on the Barbie, mate. <laughs> Thank you very much. I uh, I had to work hard for this one. Uh, yeah, man, dude. Yeah, and you you uh, I think you were the you were so close. You're like three points away from making it. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah essentially, uh, I missed out on Austria, right? but yeah. I gained uh, New York. So don't feel too bad for me. And then New Excellent. York came in a, in a crazy way because uh, I didn't qualify for that as a driver, but I was asked to go. Uh, be like one of the guys helping out with the officiating and all that. I still don't know exactly what I'll be doing. I might just be handing out sandwiches. Who knows? <laughs> hey, hand, but I'll be happy hand, to do it. Handing out sandwiches to the stars. <laughs> the stars, yes, the European ones. I'm so excited to meet these European dudes, man. That's part of the reason I was because so, I I missed out on Austria by three points because France had an awesome Joe Moss and Snake. Mm-hmm. They were they had it really tough out there, man. Second splits were so competitive. First split was even um, way more competitive. So uh, Joe Moss had an awesome uh, top sixteen race. Mm-hmm. Mine wasn't so hot, but for now we can review a little bit more of that later. But for now, that's the lay of the land. And uh, let me yeah. just say, I think I, that you were carrying Jaguar for a long time, at least up until oh, like what? round eight or nine, dude. Don't make me cringe. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I, I like. I tried 
being realistic about my performance throughout the first stage, um, there were a couple really big missed opportunities uh, and bad luck that happened. But uh, thanks really a lot for that. I feel like I carried it in this. <laughs> like I okay, I'm not gonna say I carried it at all because points don't reflect that, and I feel like I could have been better. But I've been pro I progressed really well. Thank you so much for the compliment. And it, at least in North America, it it was tough, man, because everyone wanted to get those 40s. Like, I feel like we're more ravenously attached to the idea of, of nabbing 40s because everyone felt like they could they'd do it. Like, in Europe, yeah, everyone's super quick, but uh, and it was more competitive. But it was here, too, in North America as well, in, in, a, in a strange, different kind of weird way. And I've had some... So missed opportunities. I just namely Monza, where I think after Monza I was deflated. Going into it, I was feeling really good. I was like, "Yeah, I can get a 36." We had a lead over Europe. Mm -hmm. I could keep it going with the 36. I would be really comfortable. And then I just couldn't get it done in the end, and it was really frustrating. But I learned a lot. You don't learn very much from success. But guess what, Tristan Bayless, mm -hmm. Austria bound mother. F you don't. You learn more from failing. I'm a mother fruit basket. <laughs> <laughs> well dude you were like uh, you had a third place and a second place if i recall at monza so you know that's n nothing to shake a stick at uh i think you were you were doing quite well but i i can certainly understand if you're tasting victory and you just can't quite get it uh yeah. the the closest losses are often the hardest to get over oh definitely man so i hear you yeah but you had an ins insane run of uh like victories plural please hmm. i had a That's couple crazy man I mean, uh, ever since it was sardinia b2 that was that was race like seven or eight i think the group four race yeah that, that was, was the one where i won the second slot yep and and then it was like dude it was seriously like body parts were touching and suddenly we were like in this we had like a go tank go tanks like fusion Yep. Like in, uh just we went we took off from that moment and then it was super inspirational man and, and you went on the tear dude i even got a phone call from nasa they're like why are you space docking without our approval <laughs> docks up yep docks up docks down <laughs> yeah dude uh the i mean the run i it's the competitor that takes you to victory and i would not have been uh quite so um competitive i think with uh, were it not for uh well you of course because you set such like a great example and i'm gonna go ahead and massage uh you know the the, the tummy from afar uh, mm -hmm. as one should um but also uh my uh chief competitor lester in porsche uh is you know, not to be trifled with this guy is extremely good um and I, I went into uh, the top 16 practice thinking like, oh, yeah, I've got uh, pretty good times down. Spent like three hours or something practicing. Happened to find a, a Turismo-only server where he was practicing. I joined, and uh, he like immediately stopped practicing because I think he didn't want me watching him to figure out breaking points in line and see if there's anything I could discern to get faster, which is smart. I'd, I would do the same thing. But the point being, he was laying down times that were like a quarter to a third of a second faster than me. So, uh, and this was like the Friday night before the top 16 race. I went back to the drawing board thinking like, oh, oh man, <laughs> gotta, gotta, gotta find something special somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, uh, Kim, um, my wife let me, um, uh, be absent from a few, uh, chores and such very, very nicely. Um, and I was able to get something like six hours of practice, uh, in on Saturday before the top 16 race. Um, which, you know, let it be known, is what it takes to stand a chance against uh, Lester when he's committed. So uh, credit to him for uh, setting the bar so high. Um, I started seventh in that race and finished, uh, f I think, uh, fifth or fourth. He started twelfth, uh, I think, and finished fifth, and only like less than two seconds off of me. So this is, uh, this was a tall order. Dude. Definitely, uh, it was one of my. <laughs> I would say that was one of my favorite races uh, in to uh, just uh, putting aside my my race, which wasn't very good at all. Uh, it was awesome to kind of just be in the mix, um, seeing all the shit going down, uh, people moving around, and and drama happening, the like punts and all super punts and all that shit. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was it, people had man that really separated the you know the dudes from the bo i really didn't want to 
use that old touche, uh, <laughs> cliche crap, but whatever. Uh, it's like to, it was separating the masters from the truly committed. Yeah, I like that. That's very because, well said. Because we're racing against serious, uh, extremely skillful people, but there's there's an amount of practice that is necessary that uh it's you know it's not only time it's it's like mental commitment you're thinking about the race all day when you're at work you're actually letting it affect your productivity possibly your livelihood um such as the intensity of your involvement and your willingness to um go to the next level for for any edge you can find at all uh, that's what it took to um you know just beat lester by a whisker it's not like a big lead i have over this guy so Man, I hope yeah. I can. I hope I can keep doing this for another ten rounds. It's it's that's something. It's he's nipping at my heels. I can't like rest and just think Japan's going to fall on my lap. No, especially because you have so many uh, good races in stage two at, uh, for the for in Group Four. You know, for the Cayman. Totally, I'm excited. So, especially Al Sace. The um, it's like rounds uh, like fourteen or fifteen. That's the the yeah. one fuel limited race. I think the Cayman will do quite well. I think the Jag will be pretty good there too. Yeah, that's the only kind of Jag uh hope in the calendar because that's the other thing that sucks about round stage one. So what we're referring to here, uh, in case anyone's lost, maybe listening in the twenty one hundreds, is uh, FIA Manufacturers Series uh, in Gran Turismo Sport. Okay, okay, so. <laughs> there were two stages. The first stage had mainly like well, it was it was biased toward power tracks and fuel saving. So if your car was powerful, check for the Jaguar. Mm-hmm. Check number one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and your car was also good on fuel. Check number two mm-hmm. for the Jaguar. Then you had a pretty good chance of scoring some forties, like like. Yeah, not liquor store forties, but like forty points. I was just thinking the next time I get a forty, <laughs> I'm going down to the gas station. I'm getting a forty of like a yeah. Miller High Life, forty ounce. Uh, for any Europeans listening to that, uh, forget that we just said. <laughs> the secret must not be known. <laughs> this is America uh, only. You know, in Europe they call, uh, or in England at least, they call liquor stores off license stores. Off really license weird. stores. Yeah, and then it's like, what the hell is an on-license store then? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I digress. Well, I do so, know they they call a quarter pounder a royale with cheese. In France, uh, I think in every European country, if memory serves. Are, are you going to find out in Austria? <laughs> yes. <laughs> While I listen to Mozart. <laughs> yeah, and eat some grapes. But uh, so yeah, so stage one was power track. Stage two. On the other hand, and I think they did this on purpose, they started adding a bunch of handling circuits to the calendar. You got Brands Hatch, you got like short version of um, Maggiotti, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Next one, Atopolis, which is a real tire killer. Yeah, I've been practicing for that one. Uh, it's funny, I actually just um, I got fr- I freed up use of a second PS4. Oh. So, yeah, my girlfriend started playing Breath of the Wild. Mm-hmm. She's really gotten into that. It's an amazing game. It's fun just watching that one. I highly recommend uh, getting a girlfriend so she can play it and you can watch. But um, the So it freed up a PS4 because she was mainly playing PS4 before that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's, it was funny. I was like, and as soon as I loaded up Breath of the Wild, I was like, do, 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 backing <laughs> up with the PS4. So I took it up to the room, and uh, what I've been doing lately now is I've opened up a room with just two slots. I have my I log in I, I log in on my other PS4, join the room, and I get to practice races a lot more realistically. Is it possible to like SLI two PS4s so that their um, two PS4s are outputting to one monitor for extra video performance? That was. That was a that was a feature of PS3. I don't know. They, I haven't heard of anyone hacking that for uh, the PS4, but it's not officially supported. No. Okay. I don't think. If someone figured that out, I would buy another PS4 because, right? Even it's a almost... PS4 Pro, it, it like stutters sometimes. I know. 
That's what. Oh, other thing I did. Uh, I installed the digital version of. Uh, because I took the disc out of my game, and then I got the digital version on my PS4 Pro, and I used the disc on the other one. Differences? None. Yeah. I think a slightly better loading time. That's about it. Uh, I know on PS3 you could put a solid state drive. Can you do that uh, on a PS4? Yes, you can, definitely. I should probably uh, do that. You can put a hybrid a hard drive that has a little, you know, it has its, the disc and some solid state action going on those are really cool you can put a you know 10,000 rpm raptor in in there or you can even just do a super expensive uh solid state drive that's insanely fast and yeah this it definitely makes a difference your ps4 boots faster so you know if you're andrew brooks and your game's always crashing you'll be able to get back in the lobbies right after like you know <laughs> No, no problems. Smoking restarts. We're just, you know, conjuring solutions here on Gran Turismo. <laughs> yeah, hear us. Okay. We pay for ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> we really do. <laughs> Give us money, by the way. That would be great. Uh, <laughs> Please, very much. As soon as you can. We don't have a GoFundMe, so I don't know PayPal or something. I need, I need more money for more tissue boxes to cry into. <laughs> That's not what I use tissue boxes for. <laughs> Oh, I know. <laughs> but yeah, so Autopolis is a tire killer. <laughs> <laughs> Great segue. <laughs> it indeed it is. I did a practice run, uh only one race so far. And uh yeah, mediums mediums will kind of last or they might fall off completely and you drift to the final lap. Well, as long as you are pretty conservative, right? You can no stop in your Cayman, can you not? You definitely can. Unless you're Ugh. chasing someone really hard, in which maybe oh you can't. God. That means you're going to win, and the Toyota's going to win, and the Alpha, or Dodge Lamb. I think I think top five is a good goal. I think a win will take something special. I need, a, I need to make a stop. No way around it. I could do, but I don't think racing hards are very competitive to no stop in the Jag. But, you, um, you know, I was thinking about mediums on the front and hard on the back. Yeah, that, I gotta try. I gotta experiment, but I don't have much time to practice. Oh. Well, tomorrow at least. Tonight I can, but yeah, practice, practice, practice. Sometimes you practice a little too much. Uh, I really felt for what our friend TRC Stagger Armin um, Armin A can't pronounce his last name. Aga can, I think. <laughs> yes, I can. Did you say? Uh, he definitely uh, Aga can. <laughs> he, he can Aga can me anytime. Like a Han. <laughs> but, um, He's probably blushing as he listens to this. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Shout outs. He's one of our favorite listeners and favorite people ever. He's awesome, man. Absolutely. But uh, I was feeling for him late recently because he was talking about how he felt like he maybe over practiced for this uh, first round of, sec- of the second stage, aka round 11 of the whole thing. Um, over practiced. Yeah. And I was there. Uh, I started practicing for Red Bull Ring like. Because we had a, you know, Saturday was top 16. This is last Saturday. On Saturday night, I was practicing for Red Bull Ring. And I was feeling okay. But then Sunday night, I did a little bit. And then I think Tuesday, I, I started, to, yeah, I think it was Tuesday, I started seeing Stagger online. Mm-hmm. And, uh, dude, I was racing Ant and Stagger. I was, I was hanging with Stagger. I was, I, I was like, leaving Ant behind. I mean, it may have been the first day that he hit the combo, but I was feeling mm-hmm. good about that. And then he was killing it, man. And then race day came. And I'm pretty sure he stayed consistent with his practice on that combo. Because it was a whole week. It was, yeah, mm-hmm. like you had a whole week to practice for RBR. Mm-hmm. And then race time came. And, yeah, I just couldn't couldn't quite get it together. And uh, it just happens sometimes, man. I lost motivation for it somehow. Um, I was not nearly as fast as I was when I first started practicing so it's like how do you balance it out sometimes you can burn yourself out it's tough dude it's tough you you like i've noticed a phenomenon i want to know if you've experienced this too when uh you've practiced a lot and um i think it's maybe a phenomenon that it might be exclusive to to uh hood view um y- you'll break and enter a corner and try to get like the breaking and slow down done almost like too quickly and so the middle part of the corner where you're supposed to be just entering off the throttle and letting the tires do the work, you're trying to get on the throttle like too early. And um, 
it me- makes for very inconsistent corner entries, and that happened to me in Austria. Like the the end of the second sector when you're doing the two left-handers in the middle of the course, you know, that that second left-hander really should just be like kind of an early and big lift and off the throttle, you let the car just scrub in towards the apex. But I was waiting for the last second to break and letting the rear kind of chuck around and getting dangerously close mm. to the grass on the outside and never really doing it identically lap after lap. It was always an improv- improvisation. Uh, and I know that ultimately slowed me down because it's like it's not ultimately smooth or consistent. It's it's maybe near the limit kind of regularly, but it's probably wearing down my tires too much. Uh, I noticed when I'm really wanting to do well in a race, the that sort of um, uh, compulsive uh, improvisation takes over. Yeah, yeah, it, that's a tough little demon to to fight off because it, I think it comes from a sense of uh, so it's like a combination of ego and um, boredom. Because you'll be flying around, maybe you practiced a lot, and you feel like, oh, I've been a good boy, I put in a lot of good practice, time to throw all of that shit away. You can come up with genius racing lines out of nowhere. <laughs> and a lot of the time, I think that's uh, that's a uh, one thing that you need to eliminate as you start really getting into like the top lobbies and stuff. It's interesting. It's like the 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 instinct becomes counterintuitive or counterproductive. Yeah, it could be even self sabotaging in a sense. Oh, totally. Well, a is. little bit. It definitely is. It's it's almost like you're you observe an improvement over time and practice, and you get to the end of practice, and half of you thinks, "Okay, I've set up a very consistent and fast repetitive line." do this in the race and you'll be fine. And then the other half is you like, no, no, you got to keep looking for the edge. That means you got to, as you say, throw it out all the window. <laughs> There's got to start over. You know, got to go a little deeper. Got to turn in later. Got to get on the throttle earlier. Oh, there's got to be some more speed in there somewhere. And that's uh, like a feverish, frantic desire to find even more improvement um, is self-sabotaging for sure. Yeah, interesting way of putting it for sure. I would agree with that. And it's also a big part of it is monkey see, monkey do. One of the worst uh, or one of the toughest things to break um, as you're increasing your skill with with racing and such because um, it's so easy. You, you run into some, you know, you start following but closely behind some driver and you see him do something slightly different and you're like, oh, that looks better. I should Maybe I'll try that mm-hmm. and it'll ruin your race or whatever. And um, something that uh, actually helped me out in an interesting way was uh, watching baseball. We've been doing a lot over the past few years since the Dodgers have been getting better. I've been watching more and more baseball, and Mm -hmm. it's been really fun. Mm -hmm. One thing that I've uh, been able to sort of parse from that old-timey game into my sort of uh, field of skill shit (laughs) is... uh, I'm on board. Keep going. Yes, I said words. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. What I'm trying to get at, it's very simple. Every batter has their own style of hitting the baseball, right? There's not really any bad. Like There's, there's no wrong way to do it. As long as you can hit the damn ball, mm-hmm. it goes far. It goes where you want it to go. Uh, it's the same. But it's a little more limited, but there are... It can be that, that sort of thing can be applied to racing because there is more than one way to to cut a racing line. I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. It's like the, the physique of every baseball player is, is a little bit different, a little bit stubbier, a little bit taller, a little bit more muscular, a little bit more bony, a little bit more uh, torso, a little bit more legs, and, and uh, all those combinations result in a different swing of the bat. Uh, and the ultimate goal of getting the ball onto the field where you want it is the same for all the players. They all have an, like an infinitely variable way of doing it. And uh, I see what you're saying. All racers have exactly the same thing. That that spectrum is is infinite. Like how they uh, achieve the speed they need to win the race. Yeah, and man, I I caught cut up for a while. Um, I think it stemmed this bad habit of mine that I'm going to talk about now. I think it stemmed from the, my GT Academy days, because. The time trials, man. You would hit the time trials. You would load up ghosts. You would try so hard to copy exactly what the top times were doing. Mm-hmm. And um, at least I did. You know, Maybe other more successful drivers were just using it as a reference and trying to attack it in their own way. Um, 
but I would suggest that if you feel like you've hit a plateau, most of the time that's uh, that's a big that's a big one that's uh, that tends to be an obstacle uh, in people's progress to unlocking those last few tents, you know. Mm-hmm. Totally, I uh, I'm definitely one of those people who will jump on and uh, watch replays of the the top times. But um, I gotta admit, uh, though I didn't plan it this way. Uh, maybe only a third of the time do I go on and look at replays. Yeah, the rest of the time we'll just go on and practice myself and then compare the times, not look at replays at all. But um, to watch them occasionally, I think, is definitely very, very useful. But watching them all the time and using them as a crutch, I think, is ultimate, ultimately detrimental. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's you, you take some inspiration from it, but then the other thing is... Sometimes those replays aren't exactly accurate as far as what the inputs are, um, breaking points and stuff like that. So you yeah. can't always trust it. Yeah, the breaking point, like uh, the input is like in the replay, it's too smooth because we're all stamping the brake pedal when we get to the the braking zone. You want to get the, the majority of your braking done at the earliest part of the braking zone. And in the replays, you look at the input of the brake and it's like this really nice, smooth sine curve up to maximum over yeah. hundreds of meters it's like come on they're not actually breaking like that why isn't this replay accurate so you're you're right you do have to take uh, certain idiosyncrasies of the game into account um nevertheless uh it's my opinion that at least at least steering and throttle appear to be pretty accurate for uh, uh like a one-to-one recording of of what uh the that particular driver is actually doing oh yeah and ever since the the ability to load up ghosts came in that update uh that's been really cool and uh, really helpful. Before, I wouldn't really ever mess with ghosts, but now with that, for sure, give me all the ghosts. Yep, you gotta watch them ghosts, man. <laughs> ghosts, man. Sickably yacht. So, I'm gonna talk about top sixteen. No, no, top twelve. Top twelve. Top twelve club of manufacturer series global. Yeah. Manufacturer. Ranking, ding, yeah. ding, ding. I gotta say, drama. Start off the drama is uh, those who are on the bubble. Uh, Peugeot's in thirteenth, and I think Hyundai's in twelfth. Uh, and I gotta say, I, I hope that the, those guys uh, are able to to get back into securely, uh, like eleventh and twelfth for for Japan. Are you talking about like um, Richards? Yep. Uh, charts with like uh, best five. Yep. As of now, oh, okay, yeah. Um. That's it's an interesting reference. It's going to change a lot uh, as we go on, but yeah, currently Peugeot, according to that measurement, is uh, not looking good. And so, measurements we're talking about is Rich Castro, otherwise known as one of the smartest players playing the game. <laughs> He's known as a uh, Outlaw Quadrant. Sorry, um, big ups, shout outs to him. He is very He's big. Our boy. Wom, 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 yes. Wom, 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 wom. <laughs> So he he keeps a track of uh, a lot of the rankings in his own um, spreadsheets. He has uh, a regularly updated top uh, best five out of the whatever Gosh. we're into now, which is like twelve. Yeah. He is an anxiety blessing. <laughs> yeah, man, he, he really helps out. And t- t- speaking of carrying uh, manufacturers, I don't think anyone else has besides you know, and and you succeeded where. Um, you know, Lightning couldn't with Subaru. He carried that as hard as he could, pretty much. But you have ins- not only inspired people, but um, really sent Porsche way, like, to it punched way above its weight, man. And uh, really proud of you for hitting yeah. it as hard as you have. And Thank you, man. Yeah, you changed the lives. Fucking Elite Senna is going to go to Austria, where he never thought that was even a possibility oh, of you. That's awesome. That's rad. That's so cool. <laughs> I don't think yeah. I, I carried it fully. I know that Mint GTR and uh, Black Beauty uh, were both had like 90 point totals, I think, by the end of uh, stage one. And I had like 116 or something. But, you know, it's, it's gosh, this game, and we should probably uh, use this as a great segue to talk about just how much personal commitment it takes and um, the hope that we're going to be rewarded one day. Uh, esports is growing, right? Esports is going to be the thing of the future. It's, it's as a whole, only going to go up because of uh, costs and viewership and what people are interested in and generations changing and TV viewership changing, all that kind of stuff. And motorsports, esports is just not quite there yet, but it's, I feel like it's getting close. You know, we just need the right sort of events, 
which I think Grand Turismo put on. We need the right sort of characters, and we just need uh, something viral, a few viral things to happen, and all of a sudden we're going to have the exposure that will allow uh, investment from manufacturers to, to uh, ultimately lead to possibly paid sponsorships. And what if we now are going to go to like world tours next year or the year after that have prize purses, dude? I think that's on the horizon. Yeah. Well, and they have a lot that people aren't picking up on. I mean, the, the, one of the first taglines that came out for Gran Turismo Sport was human drama, you know. And there are so many storylines. Just looking at, uh, you know, with my set of eyes, the experience that I've had, the people that I've talked to over the past few weeks doing this crazy manufacturers uh, series, um, I look at the global manufacturing, um, you know, the board. Uh, I look at it on the website and I look at every individual manufacturer and all these different storylines come to mind. I think about Ant being super on edge about, you know, being in the Mercedes, mm -hmm. uh, killing it as he usually does, but needing to kill it. Uh, that's a different kind of pressure. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, some drivers, and I look at Lexus and how um, on even a driver as strong as Andrew Deaf's son, was so antsy and, and looking at the other regions that were close and hoping that, you know, which is a, a bad aspect of this whole system, but at the same time, it, it's human drama, it's storylines, um, and Jaguar, man, I am super, super proud of that fourth place that Jaguar has fucking put itself into. That That is pretty nuts. Yeah. And it comes from our unified push, helping each other, like, Vinicius Canamos uh, in Australia, um, Snake in Europe, uh, Lamborghini in Hong Kong, and, and Legacy and Emil Grotten. Um and then we have me and Erky. You know, we have Jamal Racing King in North America, mm -hmm. uh, Sicilian Lady Circus dude. Like everyone was trying so hard. To, to put Jaguar into contention and we didn't we didn't stop there we went to fourth place like that's just it's mind boggling to me dude seeing it in, in that rank totally in previous seasons um, Jaguar was sort of just mid like belt length uh, just sort of midway there never really starring and all of a sudden Jaguar's got this huge push um, dude it's it's not Formula One it's there's there's uh, not a great divide between all manufacturers you know even like Alfa Romeo are having uh, good shows and in, in the tracks that you wouldn't think that they would. Um, you know, props to, to Daniel uh, in that regard. Like, that guy's mastered that car. It's ridiculous. But uh, the point being, because of the uh, great competitive uh, nature of uh, the way the game's set up, um, gosh, what am I getting at? I guess uh, we got to be thankful that the Gran Turismo producers have been so successful in balancing BOP because, of course... Of course, people are, are going to complain. It's just a natural thing to be cynical because it's it's good to, uh, it, it's a useful way to just vent uh, frustrations and stuff. But um, uh, cutting through that, which is really a thin layer of cynicism uh, overall, in, in my opinion, we've, uh, meaning Gran Turismo, have achieved um, a, a very level playing field. Uh, and I find that extremely exciting. And, and hopefully um, this, uh, uh, this, Freshly energized competitive fields um, will remain and will endure, not just for, to the end of this year, but into next year. Uh, this is the sort of involvement of participants that uh, you know manufacturers and other uh, possible investors are going to want to see, because there's you know there's there's no money to be made if the people who uh, are the infrastructure aren't willing to work for it. And right now we're all we're all busting our ass to try and get to the top. Um, so the human stories are there. And as long as uh, we just keep at it and eventually get that viewership, then uh, I think I think that tipping point is on the horizon, dude. It's it's within reach. It definitely is, and uh, I'm really excited to be part of the growth and um, track keep a tracking of p how people are progressing and so on, totally. and I'm, how the rules change. You're one of the people adapt. You're one of the, like the OG in uh, participants in this, dude. Um, I'm curious to hear what you think. Has this been like a just a continuous upward trend since the first GT Academy days? Do you think that we're maybe in some kind of lull in some ways? Um, are there are there components 
of uh, a public interest missing that you might suggest to be added? Or do you think that we're on a roll and it's just a matter of time now? Well, it, as far as um, general interest, it, it has to be organic and it's going to take some time. Organic in the sense that um, there are plenty of, like, uh, every time something happens in a, in a round of, of racing, uh, something dramatic happens, like one guy fucks over another one. I just, uh, I just imagine headlines like on, on the subreddits. Like right now, the Gran Turismo subreddit is pretty much a, a picture sharing yes. uh, forum. And it's kind of lame. That happens also on the sim racing forum. Everyone just posts on the, sorry, the sim racing subreddit. Mm-hmm. People just share each other's uh, racing rigs that they spent too much money on. Like no one talks about like I try to bring up threads all the time where I'm like, what are you guys actually racing? Uh, can we talk about that? Like, what leagues are you running? Right. What games are you playing? And those are so like they they don't they receive no little attention. Right. You're trying to like conjure race reports effectively. Yeah, and some people people do bite, and it's interesting, but not people not enough people are are into sim racing and such. Yeah. Uh, so eventually, it'll get there. Uh, but I think that w- when t- once you see once you start seeing Twitter posts and subreddits uh, posts and such talking about drivers, like oh my god, did you see how Deathson, uh won this race or blah? Did you see how Ant and original uh, original S fourteen mm-hmm. like had a crazy moment in this race? Like I, that's the sort of post that I I'm gonna be super excited to see because that's gonna be a big telling sign to me that uh, we're getting some real traction as far as Gran Turismo's evolution from being like a driver search to um, now becoming e motorsports uh i think it's great and it's very early days and i think the way kaz is approaching it is really smart because he's not necessarily trying to bring too much uh public attention it sounds counterintuitive and stupid and he, and i may be wrong he may be trying really hard but from my sense and my perspective it seems like he wants to sort of build this uh, he wants to build this monster in a dungeon, so to speak, mm-hmm. uh, without having too many uh, prying eyes sort of trying to get in and influence it. Like right now, he has a, a really good set of hardcore players totally. that are very loyal, totally. and they uh, are critical in construction in a construct in, in a constructive way, and which is also really good. Totally, I I've got a metaphor for you. He's. Uh, are you ready for this? Oh, yeah. He's, uh, and, and all due respect to all parties mentioned involved, he is Khaleesi, and he's got to wait a few seasons before his dragons can burn up the countryside. <laughs> but we're getting there, dude. It's just a matter oh, yeah. of time. Totally. And I, I hear what you're saying. It's, it's like, uh, and I appreciate it, too. He th- he's, he's applied very strict and deliberate constraints upon uh, the, the, the characteristic growth patterns of uh, Gran Turismo and these live events. Um, he he wants it to be a celebration of of uh, camaraderie and competitiveness, um, and and he's trying to keep it, I think, as pure as he can. Um, when we go to those live events, uh, I notice that the we're all wearing you know the the red kind of uniforms with our names on them. Um, there's there's really no team affiliation involved, at least not yet. Um, he's he's keep it he's kept it simplified to a degree so that um, it's it's inviting to the casual viewer so that the participants are easily identified without needing to be um, have uh, an announcer give exposition of like okay these are the participants no you just see them on screen you're like oh these are dudes that are all wearing kind of matching outfits with a GT logo and their name and their flag I immediately get it I've I've taken three seconds to look I've never seen this before. And I'm catching on. Okay, so what are what are they actually doing? And now it's up to like the announcers to um, uh, give uh, an exciting sort of summary on the fly of of what's happening. Um, now, just how well that can be done, I think that it's it's so far so good. Um, uh, a lot of different sports have different things to learn from when it comes to um, I- involving the viewer who's just casual, and how do they morph into the dedicated viewer it's it's about stories and characters uh it's about drama i think that uh the drama is going to be inevitable but uh i think that kaz and the pd team have so far been very respectful of 
uh, the drama in that they have not stoked flames. They have not been trying to make it like a negative reinforcement. You know, this is not real world on MTV where it's all about breakdowns and fights and stuff like that. It's uh, it's about celebrating successes and uh, learning from failures uh, rather than uh, uh, giving failure that kind of like cataclysmic edge. Instead, it's more of a, uh, well, I'll get them next time, but wasn't it interesting how this strategy worked over over this strategy? Uh, yeah, dude, uh, I've run out of words to say now. <laughs> no, well said. Lots of great points in there, and I would definitely say that uh, it it's an in- a very interesting backdrop uh, for which to put up against a lot, or put up a lot of different people to show... So, so you can see yeah, how they approach things, uh, what the best way of, because it surprises them even like they don't even like some of the strategies that come up out of this are just wild and are uh, come out of nowhere. Um, so that's also, I mean, that's one of the exciting aspects of having a, um, this sort of a sp- sport, if you will, starting off, starting in the early days. Uh, no one really knows what the best way is. And, uh, I think it's going to evolve a lot over the time. Uh, there's going to be mistakes made and all that, but it's exciting. I mean, to being a, being a part of it as it goes on, as I said before, is uh, really special. And people kind of sometimes uh, realize uh, what's going on around them mm-hmm. before trying to complain too much or, or swearing off a game and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yes, but uh, what's your favorite alien-related movie, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> There's, you know, uh, I got a list of top five. I can't say that I, I've got a number one. Um, Event Horizon, you know, that's that's it, that horror movie. It's at least it's, <laughs> it's interesting to me for like dimensional travel because it's got both uh, Lawrence Fishburne and um, uh, what is the the main bad guy? Uh, the good starts as a good guy and becomes a bad guy. He's also in Jurassic Park. You know who I'm yeah. talking about. Um, yes, I do. Uh, Englishman, Mister A, can't remember his name. Uh, what are some other ones? Uh, I thought Arrival was pretty good. Um, uh, there's there's another movie uh, that's uh, what is it called? Uh, Spaced Invaders. <laughs> I'm, Spaced. Spaced Invaders. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's like uh, these these tiny kind of like almost. Uh, Oh, what are they? They're just like lost aliens, uh, land, crash land in this Midwest town, and uh, they have this overload robot who's like gonna threaten and come to kill them, but um, they can be stopped with, I don't know, the help of ridiculous Midwesterners. It's sort of like this Men in Black. It's kind of a Men in Black. It's always shot <laughs> at night. It's weird. There's no daytime scenes. It's uh, it's very mm. kooky. It's it's almost like a precursor to Mars Attacks. It's a pretty funny movie. I like Mars Attacks. I like Arrival a lot. One of my favorite movies, and The Arrival with Charlie Sheen, also oh, yeah, great. That's good. Contact could be um, sort of, you know, she was talking. She had a scene with an alien, mm-hmm. even though it was her dad. I thought Contact uh, was was mostly amazing. Gosh, what's missing from Contact? Maybe Contact is a little depressing because it points out just how much fake action goes into the modern Hollywood movie, and Contact tries to keep like the action really just logical. So it's it's almost slightly boring, if I'm honest, but nevertheless, obviously great. Just sort of a weird, soft end to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, people should watch. People. Should, I mean, I feel like there's not enough of them these days. It's interesting to me seeing like Marvel movies where everyone so casually sort of accepts that there's an alien invasion yeah. happening all the time in these movies, and it's just like... They kind of reference it in Endgame a few times, where it's like, "Oh, you're an alien," and it's like, "Yeah," <laughs> but still, like, we're so used to it now. It's a, uh, it's almost cliche. Yeah, it's weird how the Marvel Cinematic Universe has found its success almost thanks to just finding the right frequency of casual, because it's 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 yeah. a soap opera with great special effects. Yep, it's fascinating. Just like. Yeah, and that brings up <laughs> another alien-related thing. Uh, Area 51, you know, September 20th is right around the corner. Gosh, that is and coming soon. 
uh, and I'm taking some loans out, trying to figure out uh, what the best car to buy is. You're only a couple hours away from Area 51, aren't you? Yeah, we're three hours away. It's, there's no direct route, really, but it's pretty close. Well, there is a direct route if you're doing the Naruto run, my friend. <laughs> but, well, I, I have a car that has Naruto running uh, skin on it, you know? <laughs> If if with the, if money were no object, what kind of vehicle would you take to do that? You know, like we're we're talking maximum survivability, maximum penetration, yeah. maximum secret information gathering and escape. Well, you know the 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 Descartes rally. Oh yeah, the car. Yeah, Perry Descartes. Those trucks. The huge support ones. Yeah, super high clearance. Yeah, dude. Be rolling pretty heavy in one, in one of those. That's actually few, very smart. <laughs> a few shotguns, a few miniguns, maybe some rail guns. Because that, that, has, that is truly an all-terrain vehicle. And slap some, you know, twisted metal stuff on it, like the miniguns, as you suggest. Maybe some smoke bombs, you know, to, to yes. cloud your entrance, your egress, and your escape. Now, what about... Uh, what about actually locating and taking the secret materials? Like, are you just going to be looking for uh, dossiers, or are you going to be trying to hop in like a UFO and hijack it? Um, yeah, my main goal would be to kind of punch a hole for everyone to get through. It's like in the uh, Fast and Furious 2 okay, okay. scene where all those trucks busted out of the warehouse. But uh, so after that, I would kind of just... Maybe try to pick up the dude that did get the... I just keep rolling around the perimeter mm-hmm. so let pe- other people have their fun. And then once the the guy with the uh, the severed alien head is ready to leave, <laughs> I'll just pick him up. Gotcha. So you, Eddie, Eddie Gomez is the penetrator. <laughs> Eddie Gomez is the extractor. Yeah, I've been practicing pretty hard in uh, Bunt Willow. You know, Big Willow. <laughs> the penetrator the, uh, has been practicing <laughs> hard at Button yeah. Willow. <laughs> <laughs> it's been crossing that desert over. Oh and over. my goodness, that that great chasm, the canyon. <laughs> oh good, goodness! But don't try it in the time trial. Why not? Ha- have you ever done that? Did you try the time trial at all? I haven't. New time trial mode? Isn't that like a? Uh, uh, it's not horse thief mile. It's the other one, right? Uh. Street, oh, it's Streets um, of Willow, isn't that it? S- yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Streets of Willow. Yep. I did see the GT Planet updates. Thank you, GT Planet, for being up to date uh-huh. with everything. I put your stickers oh, yeah. on my car, just so you know. It's <laughs> awesome. Uh, it I saw that there was like huge corner cutting cheating, and then <laughs> and it was interesting how, without an actual formal update file, the producers were able to just add concrete walls. Um, that is super interesting. Right? Yeah. That's like so server side. They've got a server side track editor that requires no update files. Why don't we have this track editor? Come on. Seriously, dude. Let us break your game. Please. Let us break your <laughs> game. And that, that seg- that's a great segue to those the, those hidden tracks in Grand Turismo 5, five, right? We've got like Seattle, Cape Ring, we've got Apricot Hill, we've got Midway, we've got everything. Almost everything, even even oh, like a semi playable Pikes Peak. Yeah, it's really cool. It's a YouTube channel I will look up uh, while I talk about it. But it is um, related to a GT Planet forum post. I think it started there and, and then quickly became a Discord with that attracted gr- and tons of attention. It's just crazy, man, because GT5 was out for... It had a really good run of time, you know? And uh, people broke that game. I mean, I knew guys that knew how to uh, make rain on any track using glitches. Mm-hmm. Um, there were people like some, uh, one of the weekly racing series guys from GT planet. Um, he figured out, he like broke the code of the game and or he like inc- decrypted some shit about how, uh, replays, right? So he was able to parse data from replays to, uh, for the function of checking for cheaters in this weekly uh, time trial series that's been running on GT planet forever. Um, and he was able to even manipulate it. Uh, really, really cool stuff happened. But I'm just so surprised for as long as it's been out. It's taken until 2019, like 10 years later pretty much, for someone to figure out, like, oh, yeah, there's a, hey, there's a lot of old tracks in this game that we can actually race on. 
How about that? Right. The discovery is just as interesting as the amount of time it took to achieve the discovery. Yeah, dude. And uh, there is, um, yeah, like Seattle is one of the best ones. Yeah, it, it looks great. And I do miss that track. I liked the the many jumps. That was a challenging track. Yeah. But Cape, uh, Cape Ring and Complex Ring. Dude, Complex Ring. That's my jam. Love complex. Complex ring. ring is awesome. Complex ring, like just watching the replays, and it's such a great track to figure out what a car wants to do. Every single type of corner you can think of, um, you know, with just a few exceptions of maybe like long uphill or long downhill tracks. Uh, it it had like the the sort of up and downhill S's, but you know, like on sort of hills, small hills. It was a track that almost had everything. Yeah. Yeah, super useful, man. And I remember I remember being super intimidated by it and I hardly even really touched it back then. I just wanted to be on Monaco. But so credits to the Vanishing Boy, that's the username on GT Planet yes. uh, for holding all this info down for us and uh yeah, you can check it out on the GT or Gran Turismo 5 section of the GT Planet forums. Um, there are also now moving on to GT6, so we'll see what kind of stuff they find in, in that mm-hmm. huge, huge game. Mm-hmm. It's uh, you know, it begs the question about GT5 and these hidden tracks, um, how track development uh, occurs with PD. Uh, I I get the impression that they they want to make sure that they're testing tracks in such a way that they pick tracks that logically make sense that aren't causing like weird suspension or bottoming out glitches like Red Rock Valley would. Uh, but on the other hand, licensing is always really the final deciding factor of like which tracks are going to make it in. Well, the tracks that charge what we can afford to have it in, if they're real tracks. Probably the reason why we don't have Spa yet. I'm sure Spa at this point has caught up to its uh, uh, popularity, its global popularity level. And they're like, oh, well we can just now demand any price because we're spa. And if you don't want to pay it, that's fine. We're making enough from these other guys that are renting the track or what have you. So right. um, I, I'm willing to bet that all of these hidden GT5 tracks were just kind of there, not only for development, but also just to be in stasis while um, licensing stuff was worked out. Uh, I bet a large portion of uh, Gran Turismo's um, uh, paper pushing has to do with licensing agreements. Uh, uh, I can remember a story from when I worked at Roof where uh, Gran Turismo 4 was about to come out and uh, there were something like 12 Roof cars modeled. Um, everything from like 997 RT12, which was brand new at the time, through like CTR2 Sports and BTRs and Roof uh, 3400K Boxster, 3600K, uh, RGT, uh, a few kind of one-off models, the NATO BTR, but when GT4 came out, we just had five rather than 12. Um, yeah. you know, uh, and the people I, I knew at Roof were taken aback when I delivered this news. Again, it was GT Planet who like first broke the news of the total car list. And they're like, what? We were expecting 12. It was probably just a decision made on uh, Sony or PD's end of how much they wanted to pay, what their budget was for each brand. And they had to pick just, I guess, their five favorite of the 12 Roof cars. Uh, I, I, and if that happened to Roof, then it's it's got to have happens to sort all sorts of manufacturers as well as um, you know owners of racetracks. Uh, yeah, like Spa, for instance. Uh, totally. We found out Spa was in the game since essentially the launch of GT5. But uh, if you don't know, the actual track wasn't released to the public until a year of years. I feel like it was two years it, or more. It was pretty deep into. Uh, GT5 yeah, production. that was surely a very fun update because at that point uh, I was doing a lot of league racing and around that time that was when uh, you know people have moved on to other games and stuff mm-hmm. uh, so there was only you know hardcore whatever loyal fan base around and it was a really cool reward for, for those guys I think at the same for time us. that we got Spa we also got the car that was just added to GT Sport the, yeah, the Mazda was, yes the Miata the Mazda t- Roadster the spec touring racer. car. So fun. Yeah, great, great addition. Very popular. One of those Fallout Everybody Liked It memes. Um, totally. Yeah, man. 
uh, super fun card to throw around. N two hundred class. Uh, Is it really and, only N two hundred? Yeah. Surprising. Yeah, people were speculating a lot for where it might fit into the game, but that's where it, that's where uh, people ended up. And it, it the only thing is it's super. In order to get it to, if you're spec racing, it's super fun. You just you know have it powerful, be powerful and stuff. But the BLP to get it down at N two hundred was not very well. It was a little heavy handed. Mm. So we'll put it that way. But still very thankful for the game. Just don't race or for the car. Just don't have to race other N two hundred cars with it. Mm-hmm. I've got a question for you. Y- yeah. What exactly will you be doing at the New York World Tour? Well, thanks for asking. Uh, you know, right after this podcast, I'm going to be sharpening up my sandwich making skills, <laughs> just in case. But uh, no, I, I actually don't quite know yet. Um, but from what a brief discussion that I had. Uh, with Ken a few months ago, I was just talking to him like, hey, I'd be willing to do the same thing that, you know, uh, like Terrell and JT did. Uh, Terrell Meadows, a.k.a. Uh, GT Academy 2013. Mm-hmm. And JT Lauro, a.k.a. Black Jack. Oh, I forget his other part of his name. Both regular players of Gran Turismo, uh, Terrell Meadows being the first champion for Lexus of the manufacturer series. Mm -hmm. They were on hand in the Vegas regional finals um, for Nations Cup regionals. Uh, They were in Vegas doing like, um, you know, wearing headsets, uh, talking to the crew, the racing officials and stuff. So I imagine we'll be doing some officiating and stuff, hopefully stewardship, stuff like that. I hope you do. I think that you would be a fine yeah. addition to stewardship. Thanks, man. I'll try, man. It's always been one of my uh, aspirations is because I started out doing tons of organization for of racing leagues and GT5, and it was always a big passion of mine. And just have a lot of fun bringing series together. Uh, and if I can get a taste of that by doing that for the New York World Tour, I'll be super, super psyched to be a part of that and i'm gonna be definitely asking about how much i can report back in terms of what i can talk about the uh behind the scenes stuff you know uh hopefully i can talk a lot about it i would definitely forward that info as much as i possibly can because it is super super interesting to me and i hope the same is goes for you guys so now when is new york is that the like 17th and 18th or something like that so it's uh, the 24th and the 25th, I think. Okay. Yes, 22nd is when I go out there. And I'm super excited to meet uh, Adam, Adam, as he's known, Williams, uh, for uh, Aston Martin, Adam, uh, with three R's. Hmm. Uh, old, old friends from GT5 days. Uh, it would be great to get to finally meet him in New York and to receive all the Europeans and the South Americans and Asians in America, maybe for their first times, for, for their collective first time, you know, for those that have never been in our crazy, super wild world we call America. Mm-hmm. That's another as- exciting aspect of it to me, for sure. And getting to be a part of the Vegas one and then New York, you know, both the American... Uh, events so far it's pretty cool so that's special that's pretty cool i hope that's uh you treat them to the right soup and the right pizza (laughs) oh yeah you guys don't even think about uh eating mcdonald's around me if you have a chicken nugget and you try to put it in your mouth i will pee on it he'll slap it out of their face like you're charles barkley (laughs) and i'll just like cold cock you right in the eye dude (laughs) this is what you're supposed to eat put the cookie down (laughs) <laughs> Eat some pizza from a well, not a shifty. Not if it's lightning, I guess he can he can keep his cookies. <laughs> yeah, he needs them. But yeah, uh, New York man, I'm excited seeing seeing how it all goes down and what kind of drama unfolds and relationships get stronger and others fail to fall. So we got New York coming. We got Salzburg after that. We got Tokyo in October. And then we got World Finals in November. Now, has Monaco been confirmed as the World Finals location, or are we not sure? 
Uh, well, to me, I think it's not going to be Monaco because if it was Monaco, they would have confirmed it already by now. No sense in trying to build up anticipation for a returning um, location. Mm -hmm. I was, I thought Monaco was just always going to be the one for a few years, but I guess not. Uh, just, you know, by my, that's just me saying that. Mm -hmm. Um, on feelings. <laughs> feelings, whoa. I mean, but at the same time, I struggle to think of anywhere else it could be. I guess. I mean, racetracks. It could be like at any cool racetrack. Mm -hmm. But if it's happening in what November? Yes. It's gonna be colder in certain places. I thought if you of, of Abu Dhabi, but I don't think F one esports would like that very much. Yeah, I mean, maybe. It, you're right, it's going to be like kind of equatorial or southern hemisphere for that time of year if it's going to be any sort of nice place. But, I mean, Monaco was okay in November, I guess. Yeah. Excuse me. I guess it's likely Canada, but I, I just have a feeling they're... Maybe looking at like... Throw a surprise. Maybe they're looking at like Cape Town or Sao Paulo or, I don't know, Sydney or Perth <sighs> or maybe even New Zealand or who knows. What if they, what if they bring it home? I mean, they... they PD has new studios. They do, but know? that would be like back-to-back -back Japan events. World Tour, yeah. But, you know, I mean, stranger things have happened. Well, Definitely. Who knows? Either way, I hope that both of us make it to that. Oh, me too, dude. If not, I'm going to jump into your luggage and, uh, you know, figure something out. Totally. I'll get there. Yeah, you will. <laughs> You'll be my carry-on. Oh, yeah, and carry off. <laughs> uh, well, my dude, but, what else we got? We got, uh, let's see, I think we covered a lot of stuff. Daniel Day-Lewis as Kazunori Yamauchi. Uh, we got, we got some music. Um, I think it would be cool if we maybe linked our most played songs of 2018 Spotify playlists in the description of the podcast. Oh yeah. That'd be great. If you like music, uh, you know, those, those musics that play at the beginning of each episode hand selected and inspired otherwise by Tristan and I, uh, we have tons more where that came from. So if you'd like to delve into some music, uh, fun, totally. <laughs> I mean, check it out. I commute like two and a half hours every day. So this is my bread and butter. I mean, well, Eddie, yeah. Eddie is the butter to my bread. The music is sort of like the, the hot sauce I put on top of it. Yes, I put I put oh. hot sauce on bread. Judge me. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I put all kinds of hot sauce. I put. I just got some Rwandan chili oil, by the Dude. way. Call can't pronounce the name of it, but it, it's a uh, it's beautiful. I love chili oil. Speaking of bread and sauces. Mm. But, but yeah, man. Uh, I also I'm always listening to music. So and you know who I notice has a great uh, who I've got a little insight of their music uh, choice is Daniel Wham. He listens to music while he races, and that's evident because he shared he like really quickly shared a a video clip mm -hmm. one time, and you got to hear the music that he jams out to when he races. Yeah, and it was really good. That was when I ran out of fuel. And Gumball mm -hmm. ran into the back of me, and Daniel took the win from third. Yeah, dude. Uh, and he was he was jamming out to to something. Um, I I used gosh. to love racing the music, but I, I don't do it as much anymore. Quick, I listen to podcasts. I'm old. Quick story. Uh, the, my best friend uh, autocrossed once with me. I took him out to a, a Portugal Bas autocross as a guest, and first timers always need an instructor. I was occupied, so he, my dad was. My, my best friend's instructor in his uh, Saturn sedan um, mm -hmm. from like uh, 1999 or 2001 or something. I worked course on a different run group while he was running his runs. And I remember distinctly seeing him go by uh, my corner station, you know, on his runs in the morning with my dad as instructor. And my, my friend looked just totally distraught and extremely anxious and was leaning forward and gripping the wheel with white knuckles and did not have a smile on his face was not having a good time while trying to absorb instructions. But in the afternoon, he was able to run without an instructor and was having a ball and was several seconds faster than he was in the morning. And I think it was because he had 
uh, music blasting. He was playing like Offspring at max volume, just hauling ass through the course. So that's, that's awesome. Music is like a, a, a tool to unlock focus for a lot of us. So, uh, uh, yeah, and a lot of my best of 2018 has that kind of stuff on it. And I get the impression that yours does too. Oh, yeah, I have a dedicated, uh, really old Blur Racing playlist that I'm very selectively curating for all the time. I have a play Night Driving. There's a playlist. Yeah, a... yeah, Night Driving. I have a, a Time to Win titled playlist. <laughs> nice, I like that. Uh, the, and then another one of Hard Rock called Slickness. <laughs> Just uh, stuff to get you amped up and rock yeah, out. Yeah, definitely. Sh- if anyone listening wants to share their racing playlist, that would be amazing. We could do something with that. Totally. Leave it in the comments. There's something there. Leave it in the comments and I'll yeah. add it and I'll listen. And then I'll, I'll comment with... Uh, uh, many syllabic words. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Or who knows? We could even make a mega compl- uh, collaboration playlist thing too. That'd be sweet. <laughs> so sweet. I have a, one kind of final thought and idea uh, about the trip to Austria and how several of us participants are talking to PD to try and combine our flights so we all go out SFO to Munich. Uh, those of us on the west coast, that way we can slam back a few Bloody Marys and. You know, just uh, BS our way over there. Uh, what yeah. if I were to bring along uh, like this microphone and have uh, a podcast Dude, on the airplane? Suggest that. Yes, <laughs> that'd be amazing. Uh, Definitely do that. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna pack away this microphone, and we'll see what we can come up with. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna try to bring some sort of recording something to figure yeah, to, to New York as well. See what we can do. Get some field action going. That'd be fun. Totally. At least you know, Snapchat or or something to that effect. Just uh, at minimum, like give us a teaser because we all need to live vicariously, Eddie. Oh yeah, doing it, doing it big style. All ruling. It's enough, broing out for one night. But it's fun to get back on the horse. Uh, we will now that things are a little bit more settled and uh, such. We'll get back into more regular uh, content production. So do look forward to more episodes coming soon. And continue to enjoy Gran Turismo and all of the buddies and the amazing people that uh, are part of the the family. So Mm -hmm. thank you so much for listening. I have been Edward Gomez, Eddie Gomez, Wardas. We collectively have been Gran Turismo's. You've been listening to WRDZ, Wardez FM, co-host Road Beef. Yes, the type of thing that you scrape off the bottom of your fender liner and then cook when you're desperate in the middle of the Nevada desert prior to your Area 51 storming. Thank you for listening to Grand Turismo's episode 11. Check the links for Spotify playlists. Remember to leave your own. We will comment with curiosity confusion, and possibly some confounding statements. Until next time, thank you.